Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about doing integrals. Um, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about what Cauchy principal value is, and then we'll talk about limits and a useful lemma, and then the residue theorem, calculation of residue at a pole, and the ML theorem, and then we'll go through a bunch of examples. So Cauchy principal value. Um, so what we're interested in is finding this indefinite integral. So minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx. And what we know is that if the limit exists, so if integral of minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx exists, then you can calculate it by doing a very particular limit. limit as r goes to infinity of the integral of minus r to r of f of x dx. So if you know the limit exists, then you can do this kind of an integral. You can, you, then you can do this particular limiting process to find the value of the integral. Cauchy principal value, CPV, is exactly that limit. Okay, so that's the what the Cauchy principal value is. If the limit does not exist, then this limit gives you no useful information about whether or not the integral exists or does not exist. And the classic example of that is minus infinity to infinity, x dx. You have to do that as two plus integrals. And these neither exist, right? So these neither exist, and so this limit does not exist. But the limit as r goes to infinity of minus r to r of x dx equals zero because x is an odd function. If we're doing an odd function from minus r to r, the integral is always zero. And so we're just taking the limit of zero there. And so that's not actually um, going to give us information. So the Cauchy principal value of this is zero, but it doesn't exist. So the Cauchy principal value is not particularly useful. If the integral exists, then we know that we can use the Cauchy principal value to calculate it, but not the other way around. Now, a few, word about, a few words about limits. Um, especially in regards to um, complex functions, if the limit is r goes to infinity of some function of r in absolute value equals zero, then the limit as r goes to infinity of f of r itself without the absolute value signs, without the magnitude sign, is actually zero. So what this means is, what this part means, is that if we have f of r, whatever it is, and we're taking the limit as r goes to infinity and that's equal to zero, that means the function is going in towards zero, right? And so if the modulus is going into zero, then the function has to be going into towards zero. So compare that to limit as r goes to infinity of say modulus of f of r equals one, what's that saying is, is that your function as r goes to infinity is getting closer and closer to the unit circle, right? Because that's modulus equal to one. And so your function could actually be going in there, right? 
or it could be actually just wrapping around the circle and filling many times and getting closer and closer each time, and the limit would still be in modulus equal to one, but this does not mean that the function itself is approaching one, because one would be there and that would be saying that the function is approaching there. So there's something special about zero. If the modulus is approaching zero, then the function also has to be approaching zero. If the modulus is approaching one, that just means the function is getting closer and closer to the unit circle and you don't actually know where it is. So finally, we want to have um, a particularly useful lemma. Um, and the conclusion of this lemma at the end of our argument is that, let me just find that. <clears throat> so if P of Z is a polynomial, then there exists some capital R greater than zero so that for a little r greater than r, one over modulus of p of z is less than or equal to two modulus of a sub n r to the n. And n is the degree of your polynomial. So that's a very useful thing. Um, and it's basically saying, right, if you're, bigger than a certain radius, no matter what r you're at, I can look at the modulus of one over the polynomial and it's gotta be less than basically one over the leading term, the z to the n. So an example of how to derive this, we can look at a inequality that we need from, that we'll need in uh, the first problem. So we want to show, if gamma equals r e to the i t and zero t less than or equal to pi um, and r quote unquote large that one over three z squared plus seven z plus z nope seven z plus seven in modulus is less than or equal to two over three r squared, right? So three is my a sub n, right? I have this two floating around, and then instead of z squared, I get r squared. This is what we wanna show, right? And so what we're saying is, is that if we look at the upper half circle, right, this is radius r, if I take any z that's on this point, right, so it's got a radius of r, uh, it's got a modulus of r, if I take a z on that, then one over the modulus of this thing is gonna be less than two over three times one over r squared. Okay, so how do we actually go about showing that? So <clears throat> we need a particularly useful version of the triangle inequality that we saw many, many moons ago. Well, maybe three or four moons ago. Um, that the modulus of z plus w is greater than or equal to the modulus of the modulus of z minus the modulus of w, like that. Okay, so we're gonna use that thing. So to show that this is true up here, right, that one over something, plus seven is less than or equal to two over three r squared. What that means really is what I wanna show is that this thing, the modulus of the denominator on the left is greater than or equal to one over the thing on the right. Okay, and so since we've got a greater than or equal then, that's why we need to use this triangle inequality. So give myself some more space here. Um, 
So we'll start off with 3z squared plus 7z plus 7. And we'll just do the classic thing that you do back in calculus to show that limits go to zero. We're going to factor out the 3z squared, and that leaves me with 1 plus 7 over 3 times 1 over z plus 7 over 3, 1 over z squared. Great. So I know that this then is greater than or equal. Well, I'm going to rewrite it first before I do that. 3z squared, and then I can rewrite this as 7 over 3z squared plus 7 over 3z minus, oh, I'm just going to leave it as plus 1. There we go. And now I'm going to use my inequality. So if we look at our triangle inequality that we had was uh, z plus w is greater than or equal to modulus of z minus modulus of w. My z is the 3z squared plus 7 over 3z, and the w is 1. So the left-hand side is always the same. Ditto, ditto, so still less than or equal to 3z squared modulus of 7 over 3z squared plus 7 over 3z minus just 1 because the absolute value of 1 is just 1. Okay, so good, we have that. But we know how to think about, one way to think about um, absolute values, this is a distance. So this will be the distance from this point, whatever this is, to 1, right? And so we can draw a little picture, right? Z is, who knows where Z is? Z is out here somewhere. And then we calculate this number, and that's wherever it is. Put it over here so it's not to clutter up my drawing too much. 7 over 3z squared plus... 7 over 3z, and then 1 is out here. We'll put 1 out here somewhere. There's 1. So this thing here is this distance. OK, so oh, did I get my inequalities backwards right at the start? Yes, I did. That should be greater than or equal. That should be greater than or equal. OK, so that's the distance from 7z squared plus 7z to 1. And I want to be able to bound that from below. I want to be able to say that that's bigger than something, right? Because I'd like to have a greater than or equal to something here or there. So I just have a chain of greater than or equals. OK, so what can I do with this? Well, the modulus of 3z squared plus 7z, you draw this circle that's got the same radius of this, and that point right there is the modulus of, there should be a modulus there, 7 over 3z squared plus 7 over 3z. All right, so this is a positive real number, this thing, and we want to know its distance to 1, and so I calculate what this number is, I find its distance and that radius on the um, real axis is my distance that I want to bound from below. So what I can do here is say, suppose I can get 7 over 3z squared to be within 1 fourth of the origin, and I can get
7 over 3z to be within one fourth of the origin. So what does that turn my picture into? Well, here's disk of radius one fourth. Suppose I've got 7 over 3z squared inside there. This is 1 half, and 1 is out here somewhere. So 7 over 3z squared is in there, and 7 over 3z is in here somewhere, but they're both within one quarter unit of the origin. What does that tell me about their absolute values? Their absolute values are both less than 1 fourth. So when I add these two together, I get something that's less than 1 half. So this is the sum. And then that has to be greater than one half because this distance is one half and we're worried about the distance from the sum to the origin, but it has to be greater than one half. So that means I want to be able to show that I can make this part bigger than one half. Can I make that distance bigger than one half? So that's our goal. Put these two things within one fourth of the origin. And that's actually not too bad to do because if we make the modulus of 7 or th over 3z over 7 over 3z to be less than or equal to 1 fourth, and I'll put a little question mark over that because I don't know whether or not I can, but I really can, so we'll remove that pretty quickly. That's 7 over 3 modulus of z, and I want that to be less than or equal to 1 fourth which means that I want 7, oops, 28 over 3 to be less than or equal to the modulus of z. So as long as the modulus of z is bigger than 28 over 3, it's a question mark, then I know that 7 over 3 modulus of z is in fact less than or equal to 1 fourth, so I can get rid of that question mark, and then the modulus of 7 over 3 z is less than 1 fourth. Excellent. Modulus of 7 over 3z squared equals modulus of 7 over 3z times modulus of 1 over z. And if I know that z is, modulus of z is bigger than 28 over 3, this is going to be less than or equal to 1 fourth, because I know that's less than or equal to 1 fourth, and 1 over z is 3 over 28. And so that's certainly less than 1 fourth. So as long as I have this, then I know that 7 over 3z squared and 7 over 3z are both less than 1 fourth. Now, why is that useful? So for modulus of z greater than or equal to 28 over 3, we have that modulus of 7 over 3z squared plus modulus of 7 over 3z is less than or equal to, this is the other version of the triangle inequality, and that's less than or equal to 1 fourth plus 1 fourth, which equals 1 half. So the distance from 7 over 3z squared plus 7 over 3z to 1. Well, if these two are within a half unit of the origin, they've got to be at least a half unit away from 1. Great. So we've got what we wanted, which is that this thing here has to be bigger than a half. So, what do we have after all this? Modulus of 3z squared plus 7z plus 7 is greater than or equal to the modulus of 3z squared times the modulus of 7 over 3z squared plus 7 over 3z minus one, but now we've established that this whole thing is greater than or equal to a half. So this is greater than or equal to modulus of three z squared over one half. Great. So inverting, 
1 over 3z squared plus 7z plus z is less than or equal to, if we take 1 over both sides, we get to flip that, um, 2 over 3 modulus of z squared. And if modulus of z equals r, then this becomes 2 over 3r squared, which was what we wanted. Yay. And what we require is that this r is bigger than any r bigger than, um, did we get 28 over 3? So for any r that's bigger than a 28 over 3, that's our capital R from the statement way up at the beginning, um, we get that this thing is less than or equal to that. And the argument can be generalized to get the full statement. Um, and it, in, it can be generalized in a pretty straightforward way, right? If full statement, we take P of Z to be some kind of polynomial. Then we can just, you know, follow through that same argument. Um, modulus of P of Z equals, you factor out the highest power term, and then you get A0 over ANZ to the N plus A1 over ANZ to the N minus one plus dot, 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 plus, um, a n minus one over a n z plus one, right? And so I've gone sort of in opposite order. And then this has to be greater than or equal to modulus of a n z to the n, absolute value of all of this stuff again, which I'm not gonna write out, plus dot, 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 plus, a n minus one over a n z minus one. So this is the distance from this number to one. Find an r so that for little r greater than r, each one of these things, a zero over a n z to the n, is less than one over n dot 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 a n minus one over a n z is less than one over n so above we had two terms so we want to find everything um less than a fourth actually i think i want everything to be less than one over two to the n don't i yeah one over two to the n not two to the n two times n one over two n so less than or equal to one over two n and then what does that mean? That means that this whole sum, right? When you think of that point, if each one is within one over two to the n of the, one over two times n of the origin, right? Then the sum there being n of them is within one half of the origin, which means that the whole distance a n minus one over a n z oh, minus one is greater than or equal to one half. So here's a point that's in one half unit of the origin. That's this whole thing is within one half unit of the origin, but that means it's at least one half unit away from one, which is this thing. So this now becomes greater than or equal to modulus of a n z to the n times one half. Great. And so what we have there is p of z is greater than or equal to, in modulus, is greater than or equal to the modulus of a n times the modulus of z raised to the nth power over two or one over 
the modulus of p of z is less than or equal to 2 over the modulus of an, modulus of z to the n, and that becomes this, where modulus of z equals r. This is the only step that you have to do, but it's actually not that bad because you just, there's only n of them, so there's a finitely many, finitely many of them, and so you just, you know, keep shrinking down. Just keep making this r big enough so that um, these moduluses keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you get each one of these points within one over two n of the origin, and then that works. So that's a very useful um, inequality, and we'll see that a couple of times. Okay, so going forward, what is this lecture about? It's about the residue theorem. If we have a curve going around Z0 and gamma is a path that lies in that, and there's, this is the punctured disk centered at Z0 of some radius. And there's a whole string of adjectives that go with gamma. It's smooth, it's um, simple, blah, blah, blah. Usually we think of gamma as being a circle. Um, then the normal integral around gamma is two pi i times the residue. How do you calculate residue at a pole? You take f of z equals g of z times z minus z0. And generally, uh, I will be writing this as g of z times one over z minus z naught to the m. This is my single pole, my singularity, and then this is sort of the analytic part. Um, then the residue is given by this formula. And keep in mind that the m minus one means the m minus one th derivative. So if m is two, for example, two minus one is one, so we're looking for the first derivative. And then there's the ML theorem, which if we have the maximum function on a path gamma of length L is m greater than zero, some m, then the integral along the path of the function in absolute value in modulus is less than or equal to ML. Okay, so first example, um, what's this? So to get everything to work, what we need to do is, what's the complex function that we're doing? This is actually a real integral. And technically the first thing is, does this exist? And there are lots of comparison theorems for indefinite integrals um, like this that you learn in calculus too. And it's not too hard to show that this limit actually exists. So we can use the Cauchy principle, um, Cauchy principle value. So integrand, well, we're just gonna deal with one over three z squared plus seven z plus seven. So there's a function, we'll just take the same function, but think of it as a complex function instead of a real function. What's an appropriate complex, appropriate closed simple path? We will build a path that looks like that. There's my imaginary axis, there's my real axis. It goes from minus r to r. We'll call the part along the x-axis sigma, and then this is gamma. Um, and gamma of t equals r e to the i t, so that's a radius, and sigma of x just equals x, right? And just run along there, okay? Um, this is zero less than or equal to t less than or equal to pi, because we're only doing the top half. This is for x between x and r. Um, we have two points where there's no derivative, where we switch from one path to the other, but that's okay, because we're allowed finite numbers of those. Keep in mind that gamma is, I mean, both gamma and sigma technically should, should have a little subscript r here to indicate that they both depend on r, um, and that t is a variable that moves you around this way, and then r is a variable that sort of changes how far away you are. Um, I'm not actually going to include that subscript because we just take it as understood that gamma is r e v i t where r is an appropriate radius and same thing for sigma. So what we need to know is if f of z is one over three z squared plus seven z plus seven, 
we need poles within sigma plus gamma. Remember that the notation sigma plus gamma means you start at minus r, you follow sigma first, you get to r, and then you follow gamma, and then you come back. So that's what sigma plus gamma is, sigma followed by gamma. And we want to know if there are any poles in there. So here, um, you know, denominator equals zero. You can't divide by zero. Or even in complex analysis, you can't divide by zero. So 3z three three z squared plus 7z plus 7 equals zero. What is z equal to? Well, we grind out the, uh, not the Pythagorean theorem, quadratic formula, and we get 49 minus 84 all over 2. So z is, oh, not over 2, over 6. Minus 7 over 6 plus or minus i uh, squared of 35 over 6. So just as some useful notation, r plus is the plus sign. So I don't have to write this root out over and over again. r minus is the minus sign. Great. So there's our two poles, right? There's our two problems, r plus, r minus. And r plus, right, is above the um, axis. So when r gets big, this, oh, too many r's. For gamma and sigma, as they get bigger and bigger, we're going to include r plus within side sigma plus gamma, but we will not include r minus because r minus is in the lower half plane. So I need a residue of this function at r plus. Okay, so f of z then is 1 over 3z squared plus 7z plus 7. We found the two roots, so it's 1 over 3z minus, let's see, r minus times z plus minus r plus, because that's how quadratics factor. And I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over 3 z minus r minus times 1 over z minus r plus. And again, this is my singularity, my pole, with m equals to 1. And then this is the analytic part, g of z. And what am I referring to there? Well, the formula for finding the residue, I'll just sort of state it again, is in this case, residue of f at r plus equals g at r plus. So m is equal to 1, so we just want to know what this function evaluated at that pole. So that's 1 over 3 r plus minus r minus. r plus minus r minus, the minus 7, 6 cancel out. We get i root 35 over 6 times uh, plus another i root 35 over 6. So that's going to be 1 over 3 times 2i root 35 over 6. And all the numbers cancel out, and you're left with 1 over i root 35. So that's our residue. Um, oh, and I should actually evaluate the complex integral while we're here. So the integral around sigma plus gamma of f of z, dz, is 2 pi i times 1 over i root 35. Um, the i's cancel out, and we're just left with 2 pi over root 35, right? So just going through my notes here to make sure that I got the right number there. Um, right. 
2 pi over root 35. Excellent. Okay, so what we've done then is we've evaluated the complex integral around this path, but we want to really know it's what's this thing. And that's the part along the real axis. So split the complex integral into parts. Integral around sigma plus gamma of f of z dz equals integral around sigma of f of z dz, not around along sigma plus integral along gamma of f of z dz. And now we can do a little bit of simplifying. This thing is the integral from minus r to r of 1 over 3x squared plus 7x plus 7 dx, right? Because that's f of z along the real axis where um, z equals x plus i times 0 on the real axis. So we just get our integral. And really what we want to do is eventually take the limit as r goes to infinity for this. This thing is a little bit trickier. It doesn't simplify in any nice way. But what we do know is that this whole thing is 2 pi over root 35. So what our fantasy is, is to make sure that this goes to zero. And that's where the ML theorem comes in. So if we look at the absolute value, the modulus of the integral of gamma of 1 over 3z squared plus 7z plus 7, dz is less than or equal to what? We want it to have it less than or equal to something. And it would be less than or equal to ml. L equals the length of gamma. And that's just pi times r. It's half of a circle, right? They're half of a circle. So pi r. M is something that's bigger than 1 over 3z squared plus 7z plus 7 on gamma. And gamma is where modulus of z equals r. But we know that from our lemma above, is less than or equal to, what was it, 2? over 3r squared, so a 2, and then just the leading term replaced with an r. And this is 4r bigger than 28 over 3. And since we're letting r go to infinity, greater than or equal to 28 over 3 is just fine. So what is the limit as r goes to infinity of this integral? that's less than or equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of m times l, because this is a positive number. This is, everything inside is positive. m is 2 over 3r squared, and l is pi times r, and that limit is zero, because once your r's cancel out, you've got an r in the bottom, and you let r go to infinity, so you get zero. So what we also know that means is that the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral around gamma of dz of the function equals zero because the absolute value goes to zero, so the function goes to zero. Great, so take our limits to evaluate the integral. So we know from up, here that 2 pi over root 35 equals the integral from minus r to r of 1 over, well, dx over 3x squared plus 7x plus 7 plus the integral from around gamma 
of dz over 3z squared plus 7z plus 7. And then we take the limit as r goes to infinity of everything. Well, of both sides. And what we know is that the limit of a constant is just a constant. Limit here is minus infinity to infinity of the integral, the Cauchy principal value. And plus zero. So we have found out what that integral is. It's two pi over square root of 35. And you can see that pi is going to show up a lot in these um, integrals because it's 2 pi i times the residue. And it's 2 pi i times the residue because the circumference of a circle is 2 pi. And that's where that 2 pi comes from. So very similar um, kind of question. We'll do this one a little bit quicker. So. Our function is f of z equals uh, 1 over z squared plus 1 times z squared plus 4. So we'll just go with the complex version of the same thing. Most simple path, exactly the same as above. r minus r sigma gamma. I'm not going to do huge details there. Poles and residues. So z squared plus 1 equals 0 gives z equals i, z equals minus i as two poles. z squared plus 4 equals 0 gives me z equals 2i and z equals minus 2i as um, poles. So those are my poles. It's where the denominator equals 0. And those are the four poles that I have. We're only looking at upper half plane. So z equals i and z equals 2i are places in the upper half plane where I have poles. So I need to find the residues at that point. Oops, went a little too far. So to find the residue of f at i, we'll look at our function, which is 1 over z squared plus i z squared, oops, z squared plus 4. I should actually just undo that. I should have paid for the more expensive tablet. That makes a lot of this more easier. And it allows me to have colors. I would really like to have colors. So that's z squared plus 1, z squared plus 4. And I can factor out my z minus i term. So this is z plus i over z squared plus 4 times 1 over z minus i. So there's my pole. That's this term. And then this is the g of z term. Since it's a first order pole, I just want to know what's g at i. So what's g of i equals to? If you plug i into this function, you get, um, where am I in my notes? Oh, not sure where I am in my notes, so we'll just do this. Um, this will be 1 over 2i, and then i squared is minus 1, so 3, so this will be 1 over 6i. So that's my residue. So what about at 2i? Residue of f at 2i. Well, we'll do the same sort of thing. We'll take z squared plus 1 times z squared plus 4. And we'll leave the 1 over z squared plus 1 alone, but we'll factor the z squared plus 4 into a z plus 2i. 
and then times a z minus 2i. So there's my, oops, there's my pole. And when I'm at 2i, this is my function g of z. Important point here, right? Every time you calculate a residue at a point, you have a different g of z, right? So the g of z for i is this one. The g of z for 2i is this one. They're slightly different. And so my residue will be g of 2i. If I plug that in, what do I get? I get 1 over 2i squared is minus 4. So this will give me a 3 and a 4i, and that's a 12i. Oh, wait. z squared is minus 4 plus 3. So I get a minus 12i here. Great. And so that's my residue of f at 2i. Okay, so what is the complex integral around sigma plus gamma of 1 over z squared plus 1 times z squared plus 4 dz? That is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues, so 1 over 6i minus 1 over 12i. And that's 2 pi i over 12i. And if we cancel things out, we get pi over 6. OK, and so you can see where this is going. We're going to get pi over 6 equal to this integral. Um, but we have to make sure that everything works out. So the complex integral gets split into parts. The integral sigma plus gamma of 1 over z squared plus 1, z squared plus 4, dz gets split into the integral around sigma over sigma of 1 over z squared plus 1, and dz in the top, z squared plus 4 plus integral around gamma, dz over z squared plus 1 times z squared plus 4. Oof. OK, this, as before, becomes the integral minus r to r dx over x squared plus 1, x squared plus 4. And again, that's the integral we want to um, evaluate. This integral, we want to go to 0 as r goes to infinity, but we have to use that ML theorem for that. So L is still pi r because it's the upper half of the circle. Um, we know that 1 over z squared plus 1, z squared plus 4 in absolute value will be less than or equal to 2 over r to the fourth because our coefficient of, z, if you multiply this out, you get z to the fourth plus some stuff. So it's 2 over r to the fourth. You just have to remember that that 2 is there. So integral around gamma, dz over z squared plus 1, z squared plus 4 is less than or equal to 2 over r to the fourth times pi r, which equals 2 r cubed. Great. And in particular, so what do we get? The limit as r goes to infinity, why did that happen? r goes to infinity of the integral around gamma, z squared plus 1, z squared plus 4, dz in absolute value equals 0 because it's all less than or equal to 2 over r cubed. And as r goes to infinity, that is 0. And that tells me that the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral itself without the absolute value signs is also 0. So, 
what's the limits involved here? <clears throat> we know that pi over six is equal to the integral around sigma plus gamma of, I'm just gonna call this f of z because I'm getting tired of writing one over z squared plus one or one over z squared plus four. Um, and that equals the integral over sigma of f of z dz plus the integral around gamma of f of z dz. We take limits. And here I'll actually rewrite this as minus r to r one over x squared plus one, x squared plus four, that's a dx, plus the integral around gamma of f of z dz. And I need a limit as r goes to infinity there as well. But we know that this is pi over six. This is our Cauchy in a principal value minus infinity to infinity of dx over x squared plus one x squared plus four, and that that goes to zero. So pi over six is our answer there. So when we're dealing with fractions, rational functions, it's really not that bad. It depends on, though, on your ability to figure out what the roots are of the zeros. What about trig functions like this? Cosine ax over x squared plus one, all right? And here, finding the appropriate complex function is a little trickier. Um, so now I'm going to x squared plus one. Yes, got the right page. Okay, so can we find the appropriate complex function for this? What we want to remember here is that, well, actually, let me just say this. The function we're going to be looking for is e to the i a z over z squared plus one. That's the f of z that we're looking for. Why are we interested in this? Um, so on the real axis, z is x plus i zero. So on the real axis, this is f of x equals e to the i a x over z squared x squared plus one. And it's important that the y is zero because that means I have no i term coming from z. So this becomes cosine a x plus i sine a x over x squared plus one. So on the real axis, the real part of e to the i z over z squared plus one, which is the function that we're working with there, is in fact the function that we want to integrate. So when you see a cosine, you have to think of real part of exponential function. When you see a sine, think of imaginary part of exponential function. So we have a function, a complex function, whose along the real axis is exactly the same as the function we want to integrate. And so now we can crank out our machinery. Appropriate closed simple path is the same thing as before. R minus R sigma gamma. Poles and residues. So our function is f of z equals e to the i a z over z squared plus one. Exponential function, very well behaved. No poles and residues coming from that. This equals zero for z equals plus i, z equals minus i. This is the pole in side of sigma plus gamma. And remember that sigma plus gamma, we're thinking of r is going to infinity. So sooner or later, um, i is going to be in there. So residues, residues of f, of f at i, well, f of z is equal to e to the i a z over z plus i 
times one over z minus i. There's my pole, and there is my g of z. So the residue of f at i equals g of i, which is e to the minus a over 2i. Right, because if you plug in i in for z into this function, you get minus 1 in the top. So the integral of f of z over sigma plus gamma of my function f of z, which in this case is this thing, bz equals 2 pi i times the residue, and that's pi over e. Oh, once it's gone down into the denominator, it's a positive exponent. So e to the a. Great. So, you know, at the end of the road, we're going to find our integral is actually going to be equal to something involving pi over e to the a. So we split our complex integral into parts. Integral around sigma plus gamma of f of z dz equals integral around sigma of f of z dz plus integral around gamma, but not around gamma, along gamma, because gamma is not a closed loop in itself, of f of z dz. We know that this is all equal to pi over e to the a. This is the integral from minus r to r of e to the minus, no, not e to the minus, minus sign yet, e to the i a x, i a x over x squared plus one. And then this is an integral that I need to evaluate. And in fact, I don't want to evaluate it. I want to use the ML theorem again to show that that's going to actually go to zero. So we're dealing with the integral along gamma of e to the i a z over z squared plus one dz. So l is still pi r. And then the question is, what's m? So we want to deal with first um, just point out that e to the i a z over z squared plus one in modulus is equal to the modulus of e a i to the z over the modulus of z squared plus one. We know how to handle the z squared plus one in the denominator now. We're going to end up with a two over r squared. But what about this thing in the top? So on gamma, z equals r e to the i t, which is r cosine t plus i r sine t. So e to the i a z on gamma is minus a r sine t plus i a r cosine t. Right, so if I multiply both sides of this by my IA, I get IA times minus I gives me a minus A R sine T. And then when I multiply by the cosine term, I just get the AR cosine T. Great, so on gamma then, um, E to the A I Z, equals e to the minus a r sine of t times e to the i a r cosine of t. And so finally, the modulus of e a to the z is equal to the modulus of e to the minus a r sine of t times the modulus of e to the a r i a r cosine of t. This is one, because it's on the unit circle, right? It's e to the i times some real number. 
and that means you're on the unit circle, so it's modulus of one. This part, well, remember that sine of t is between zero and minus one. Um, so it's a nice real number. E raised to any number, that's just some nice real number, is actually positive. So I don't need the absolute value signs. So that gives me my um, modulus of E to the I A Z. So what about this thing? E to the minus A minus a r sine t. So remember that t is between zero and pi. And what that means then is that sine of t is between zero and one, because we're only on the top half of the unit circle. And what that means then is that minus a r sine of t is less than zero because of the minus sign. A is assumed to be a positive number, R is always assumed to be a positive radius, so that's gonna be negative. So at the end of the road, we have E modulus of E A to the I Z on gamma equals E to the minus A R sine of T, and that's less than or equal to, less than or equal to, e to the zero, which is one. So modulus of e a to the i z over z squared plus one is less than or equal to one, which is what I get for this, times two over r squared, which is what I get from the z squared plus one. And so finally, at the end of the road, we have that our integral way up here at the top that we're, we're wrestling with, integral around gamma of e to the i a z over z squared plus one dz in absolute value is less than or equal to two over r squared times pi r, which is two pi over r. Okay, so, What does that give me then? Limit, as r goes to infinity, we've seen the show of that integral, the so we'll go back to the f of z dz equals zero, and that means that the limit as r goes to infinity of the actual integral itself is zero. Yay, so now we want to take limits to evaluate my integral. Um, be able to scroll down here a little bit. Boink, 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 boink. So what was my integral is pi over six, I think up here somewhere. Yes, no, pi over e to the a. All right, so we're gonna take this equation, pi over e to the a equals, equals integral around sigma, of e to the i a z over uh, what is this, z squared plus one plus integral around gamma of f of z dz. And I wanna have these in terms of z here because um, I need to switch the variable a little bit there. And this is just gonna go to zero. So we can rewrite this as pi e to the a equals integral from minus r to r of e to the i a x over x squared plus one dx plus the integral around gamma of f of z dz. Take the limit as, as r goes to infinity of both sides, which I'm not gonna write out again, but we know that the left-hand side becomes pi over e to the a. The right-hand side becomes minus infinity to infinity of e to the i a x over x squared plus one dx plus zero. Yay, so we've got our solution. Or have we, right? Um, and we don't, right? Because we've got an i in there. So that's really annoying, but that's not too bad. Um, 
or do we? Right, so pi over e to the a equals integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine ax over x squared plus one plus i integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine ax over x squared plus one. There ought to be dx's floating around. Keep in mind that my e a to the i x is because there's an i and these are both real cosine ax plus i sine ax. So I can split the integral into two parts by taking the real and imaginary parts. The real part of pi over e to the a is equal to the real part of the right-hand side, but pi over e to the a is a real number itself, so it's its own real part, and so that's gonna be equal to minus infinity to infinity cosine ax, over x squared plus one dx. So finally, we're done. Or are we? Dum, dum, dum. Um, and no, because we actually didn't want this integral, we wanted a different integral. But luckily for us, our function is a even function, x squared plus one dx. And so finally, we get pi over two e to the a equals the integral from zero to infinity of cosine ax over x squared plus one dx. So integrals from zero to infinity, keep in mind that if it's an even function, this all works. If it's an odd function, then it doesn't. That's one of the reasons why this integral um, is zero. It actually does converge and it does exist, but it's, um, the, the integral is actually zero because it's an odd function. Yay, so that gets us through on that and we found the integrand for that. And so now um e to the a z limits pi over e to the a pi over two e to the a. And then that one we did just going through my notes here to get figure out where I am. Okay. Cosine two x over x squared plus four squared dx. So same deal, integrand, cosine, we wanna do f of z is e to the i a z over z squared plus four quantity squared. At the end of the road, we're gonna take the real part of whatever integral we get, and that'll give us the cosine two x thing that we want. Oh, sorry, we actually have a equal to two here. So it's not e to the a z, it's actually e to the i two z over z squared plus four quantity squared. Great, what's my appropriate smooth path? Well, no big surprise, this is gonna turn out to be gamma plus sigma again. So there's sigma, there's gamma, and we're going from minus r to r. Find the poles and residues and evaluate the complex integral. So our function is e to the i two z over z squared plus four quantity squared. More convenient to write that when we're looking for poles in factored form, so z plus two i quantity squared z minus two i quantity squared. So you can see where your poles are. Z equals minus two i, z equals two plus two i. This one is inside my path sigma plus gamma, so that's the residue that I have to calculate. So, f of z equals e to the i 2z over z plus 2i quantity squared times 1 over z minus 2i quantity squared. And note here, that was a little bit of a too dramatic error. Note here that m equals 2, which means we want 
g prime at 2i, where this is my uh, g of z. Okay. So, we should be able to figure out what g prime of 2z is because we should be able to figure out what g prime of z is because that's just pretty much straightforward. Um, calculus. So g prime of z, I usually am not super good with the um, quotient rule, so I usually do them with the product rule and the chain rule, so I get 2e to the i 2z, and then minus 2 z plus 2i to the minus 3 plus e to the i, oh no, I don't differentiate there. Well, apparently I'm not too good at the um, product rule either. So it's 2 plus i e to 2z times z plus 2i to the minus 2 plus e to the i 2z minus 2, z plus 2i to the minus 3. There we go. So what's g prime of 2i? It's 2e to the minus 4 times 4i to the minus 2 plus e to the minus 4 times minus 2 times 4i to the minus 3. Right. So, uh, doing a little bit of bookkeeping, I can take out my 2e to the minus 4 out of both. There's one there, and there's one there, and I get a 1 over minus 16, and then a minus uh, 4 cubed is 64, minus 64i. Okay, no, yeah, the i stays there. Great, so, oh, didn't wanna hit that. 